Welcome to our worship service for this Sunday after Easter. We are delighted that you can join us. We'll be so happy when we can open these doors again. We'll be looking for you when we do. Our arms and hearts are ready to see you again, and we just send many blessings. Welcome. Everybody had a wonderful Easter last weekend. Uh, our first reading will be coming from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. Behold, my servant, who I am uphold, my chosen, who, whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus God, thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and a spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison of those who sit in the darkness. I am the Lord, and that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare before they spring forth. I'll tell you of them. And some more thoughts about prayer. I remember journalist Bill Moyer was uh, on Lyndon Johnson's staff. Uh, he worked for Johnson when he was vice president. And then after Kennedy's assassination, Johnson became the president and Bill Moyers was elevated to his press secretary. Bill Moyers is also an ordained Baptist minister. And as a consequence, being the resident clergy person on the staff, he was called upon to pray from time to time for certain kinds of meetings and what have you. And on one occasion, um, the president asked him to give a prayer and after delivering the prayer, Johnson called him over and said, Bill, um, I, I couldn't hear a word you were saying. 
And Moriah's replied, Mr. President, I wasn't talking to you. Well, Johnson took that in good humor, good, <laughs> good thing. Um, no, knowing who we're talking to uh, is important, and it's particularly important when it comes to prayer. There's a truism that says <clears throat> we learn to pray by praying. Well, that's certainly true. But as Christians, we have the master teacher. And when those early disciples, those first disciples of Jesus, came to him on occasion and asked him to teach them to pray, he obliged. And Matthew's gospel records, records it, Luke's gospel records, records it as well, but I'm going to read Matthew. It's in the sixth chapter, uh, beginning with verse 9. Jesus said, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial or tempting, but rescue us from the evil one. Well, that's been called the model prayer. More popularly, of course, the Lord's Prayer, and most of us are very familiar with it because it has uh, become a part of the litany of the worship of the vast majority of Christian denominations, churches uh, throughout, uh, throughout the world and for, for many, many, many centuries. Uh, it is a significant, a significant thing. Unfortunately, it has become something that is committed to memory and sort of rotely or routinely recited. But the fact of the matter is, this was one of the probably more significant things that Jesus ever taught because it deals with who we're talking to and it puts it in that proper perspective. Um, it starts at the right place. Uh, we need to get this God thing straight, and Jesus got it straight, and he, he did it in a way that is unmistakable. God is our heavenly Father. He is not some super cop up in the sky waiting to zap us or um, come down on us when we step out of line and do things that are inappropriate. No, he is our heavenly Father. Now, remember the story that Jesus told. It's often called the prodigal son. It could also be called very well the, the waiting father. You know the story. The wayward boy that went off and did scandalous things, brought shame on the family name, did everything wrong. And when he decides that he's done everything he can do, he goes back home and he is seen by the father coming. And in the story that Jesus tells, the father doesn't stand there with crossed arms waiting for that bad boy to come home so he can scold, reprimand, chastise, punish perhaps. When he sees the boy coming, the father in this story runs to meet him with open arms, embraces him, loves on him, and restores him to where he needs to be. This is our heavenly Father. That's who we're talking about. And in prayer, that's who we're talking to. So receptivity is there. Uh, all we need to do is move into those open arms that are already ready for us. The prayer begins, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done, orienting where we're headed, where God wants us to be. And then we get down to business about daily bread, um, about forgiveness, about temptation, and then any and all other things that are significant in our own lives or our concerns, our issues, our fears, our hopes, our dreams, all of that comes. But first, 
know who we're talking to. He's glad to hear us. And, and that's, that's such good news. And it is such an in, incredibly important part of who Jesus was and what he did and how he demonstrated uh, the Heavenly Father. Um, I sure hope that in these days where we've got time on our hands, you're making time, taking time, finding time, certainly, uh, to spend some time in prayer. Uh, of course, there's so much to pray about always, always, in any circumstance or at any time. But in this particular time in which we're living, our hearts and minds are heavily focused on the current crisis, of course. Um, and uh, much attention has been given uh, uh, to those who are out there on the front lines, those who are, who are suffering from the virus and, and, and critically ill, and then those who are ministering to them medically uh, those first responders uh, are capturing our hearts and minds during these days. And just this past week, it was called to our attention that we have in our church some families who have children who are there on the front lines. Uh, Tammy Eubanks, her son Bobby Eubanks, is a paramedic in New York City on the front lines today. Um, uh, Steve and Roberta Higley have a daughter, Jillian Higley. She is an emergency room nurse in Atlanta, Georgia, which is another hotspot. And she is on the front lines dealing with that today. Dustin, New, uh, Dustin uh, Turnipseed, the son of uh, Doug Turnipseed, is a dentist who was just activated back into the Alabama National Guard. The Guard is activating all of its medical personnel to make them available to confront the virus here in the state of Alabama. So these three families are directly implicated in this issue, and there very well may be others. And the reason I'm bringing it up in order for us to be able to pray for these specifically but also to request that if you know of others in our church family that are there on the, on the firing line, on the front line, please let us know. Because we, we pass these names along to our prayer group, and these folks are being faithful. They can't meet together, together, but they are meeting, they're communicating, and they are lifting up in prayer, these who have these very special needs. So, so if you'll let us know the, the, that, uh, it will be most helpful to us. And in light of what we've talked about here uh, today, it might be well for us to say that prayer that we know is the Lord's Prayer. Would you join with me? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Bless you. Well, hello again. So glad that you joined us today with St. Andrew by the Sea. This is our children's moment for the Sunday of Easter, the second Sunday of Easter. <clears throat> I was thinking this morning about IDs. Now, if you are with your parents and they ever go anywhere in the car, they should definitely have their driver's license. Uh, this tells people who they are. They are used for so many different things. I know if I go shopping at Sam's Club, they offer a Sam's Club card, but also on the back, you must have an ID with it. If you use your debit card or if your mom or dad shops and uses their debit card, they have to have their ID so that they know who you are. This is the week after Jesus has been crucified. He was placed in a tomb and his body was not there when his, the people that loved him the very most went to go and see him and to anoint him. His body was gone, it had been resurrected. So now we're at the point here in John and this is in chapter 20 and it's at the verse of 
24. And this is when Jesus was appearing to his disciples. The disciples were upstairs in an upper room locked away, and I can only imagine that they were pretty nervous. They were pretty scared and sad about the death of their Jesus. Thomas was not with the disciples when Jesus appeared to them. Jesus appeared in the locked room. The disciples, they couldn't believe it. And when Thomas finally came back, Jesus had already disappeared again. Thomas said, I don't believe it unless I see it and unless I can feel Jesus and put my hand where his wounds are. He was asking for ID, some kind of proof because this was just unreal. You couldn't hardly believe this. This really weighs on me right now, these scriptures here, because we are in a time where if you had told us this was going to happen in our society and with our church and with our people months ago, we would not have believed it unless we had seen it. We just passed Easter when it was a fabulous celebration at the house and I hope you had a great one. But generally, we're here at our church celebrating together. I would not have believed that before. I saw it with my own two eyes this Easter. What I, what I saw also though, was that people found ways to connect and to love with one another. They found ways to put Christ in the middle of the midst of the craziness of what we think is just something new, something we're not sure about. Christ was still there. They had drive through churches this Sunday for Easter. There were people worshiping on the streets, keeping their safe social distance. Christ was admit, amidst, in the midst of the most difficult parts of some people's lives. We can look for IDs that are physical, like cards, and we can also look for spiritual IDs. I hope in the coming days and the following weeks that you guys can find where Christ is and identify his blessings and his love in everything that is to come. Many blessings to you. Good morning again. The second reading comes from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and another at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to, in Arabic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers and, and say to them, I am ascending to my father, your father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Blessed be the reading of this book. It seems that we all have been holding on lately. George Myers has been waiting for rain to come for his satsuma tree. The fruit, he says, is just at that point where it really needs moisture, but we didn't get the storm that was promised the other day, and he's been telling those satsumas, hang on, just hold on, weather's on the way. If anybody from the office has needed a bit of a pick-me-up lately, it is Pat Strahan. Usually she is caffeinated, but throughout Lent, she was doing without coffee. She had given it up entirely, which was a real challenge. And it wasn't until the day after Easter that she realized, wait a minute, Lent ended last Thursday. And so she came in this morning and made the biggest pot she could. We all have been holding on. Many of us have been holding on through these days of confinement. Chances are that you too have been dealing with the issues that arise from our staying in, whether that means a little too much togetherness, 
or whether that means too much loneliness. Some of us have been unable to go in for work. Others have been able to keep scheduled appointments with doctors or surgeries that were long planned. We may be wondering, good heavens, what is next? We've been wondering how we're going to get from today to tomorrow. And we ask, good God, what is next? Those were some of the questions that Mary Magdalene asked as well. We know from all four Gospels that she went to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. But when she arrived, she found the stone rolled away, the tomb standing open, and the body missing. For someone who was already stricken with grief, this must have been an overwhelming blow. Mary must have wondered, good God, what's next? But that, according to the Gospel of John, is when she received a visit that reassured her. According to John, she saw first a, a man standing beside the tomb whom she supposed to be the gardener. And she said, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she said to him, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. It's one of the most powerful stories in all the Gospels. This tale of how Mary was at the very end of her tether when she just couldn't hold on any further, and then she saw Jesus. But what did Jesus tell her? He didn't take her by the hand. He didn't wrap her up in his arms as she may have wanted. No, instead he said something very curious. He said, do not hold on to me. And that's a challenging word for many of us in these days. We're at about the ends of our ropes. What are we to hold on to? Well, this is where Jesus is offering counsel that we may have heard in other places, such as 12-step programs, to let go, to let go, and to let God. It's counsel that we have found on many occasions in the Bible, both in the Old and the New Testaments words of reassurance that we are in God's good hands. For all that we have tried to control, ultimately we have found that there are limits to what we can do, to what our, our own hands and, and hearts can accomplish. There comes a point where we need to release and relax to let God be God. One such counsel comes from the 42nd chapter of Isaiah. Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you 
by the hand, and I have kept you. Some days ago, we received word in the news that one of our country's great songwriters, John Prine, had just died of coronavirus. He was a, a funny and a mordant and in many ways a deeply spiritual songwriter who put out an album just a year or so ago called The Tree of Forgiveness. It's a great album and it's got all kinds of terrific songs. But one that was most striking was the very last. It was, it was the last song that he released. It was called When I Get to Heaven. And in it he imagined what he would do when he finally received his reward. And he said, I'm going to have a cocktail. Vodka and ginger ale. I'm going to smoke a cigarette that's nine miles long. I'm going to kiss the pretty girl on the tilt-a-whirl. Yeah, this old boy is going to town. It may sound kind of jokey, but John Prine had made sure that other songs on the album had prepared us for just that moment. He'd also written a great song called Boundless Love. It came just, just right before that. He said... Sometimes my old heart is like a washing machine. It bounces around till my soul comes clean. And when I'm clean and hung out to dry, I'm going to make you laugh until you cry. Surround me with your boundless love. Confound me with your boundless love. I was drowning in a sea, lost as I could be, when you found me with your boundless love. So John Pride has reached his great reward. He is enjoying a vodka and a ginger ale and a cigarette that's nine miles long. In other words, he has entered into the good and loving arms, into the good, good hands of God. In these anxious times, we here on earth may be asking, Oh, my God, what next? But what's next is that we are going to find out how good God is. It's as if God is saying, let go. I've got this. I've got you. I've got this. We are in good hands. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you soon in person. But for now, may the love of God 
the peace of Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, everywhere we are, until we meet again. Amen.